Hi there, welcome back for another lesson. In this lesson, we will talk about endothermic and exothermic reactions. So endothermic means that the energy is entering the substance or the reaction, and exothermic, the energy is exiting the reaction or the substance. So we will make the distinction between a physical reaction and a chemical reaction in this case. So first we will take a look at physical changes. But before even I talk about physical changes, I want uh, to make a general statement. So energy always flows from something warm to something cold. So there is no such thing as a cold object or a cold body. Something that we call cold is really a body that has less energy than another one that is deemed warm. So something that is warm has a lot of energy, something that is cold has less energy. But there's no such thing really as something being cold. So your fridge is not cold, your freezer is not cold, an ice cube is not cold. It's really the freezer, the fridge, or the ice cube. Those items have less energy than other objects that we might compare them to. Okay, so if we look at an exothermic situation, so here you have a little bit of an illustration. So let's say we're looking at a hot pan. So this would represent the pan. The pan is warm and this represents the environment. So we're always comparing the object, the substance and its environment. Which one is warmer, which one is colder? So in this case, the pan is warmer than the environment. So it will release energy into the environment. Now, I can't put a thermometer straight onto the pan and measure its temperature. My thermometer will probably melt or break or whatnot. So what I can do maybe is put my thermometer next to the pan and try and pick up a change in temperature. Now, this will not be accurate, but it would show me an increase of temperature. So why is it that the air around the pan would have an increase in temperature? Well, it's because the pan released energy into the surrounding air. So when we measure temperature, it's kind of an indirect way of determining if an object is warm or cold. Okay, so by measuring the air around the pan, the air is becoming warmer. Why? Because the pan itself is very hot and it's releasing energy into its surroundings. So this is an example of an exothermic physical change. Now here, well, it's not really a physical change, but if it's a physical situation, the pan remains the pan, the air remains the air. It's just a, a transfer of energy in this case. Now, if I look at an endothermic reaction, physical change in this case, so I might have an ice cube that's melting. So this is my ice cube and this is the surrounding room or it could be the palm of your hand. So let's, be, let's pretend it's the palm of your hand. So your hand is very warm relative to the ice cube. So the ice cube being colder, it has less energy. So since we know that energy flows from what's warm to what's uh, less warm, so colder, well, your hand will give energy, you can see the arrows here, your hand will give energy to the ice cube. So because the ice cube is absorbing energy, we call this endothermic, the energy is entering the ice cube, and because of it, the ice cube will start melting. So when the energy enters the substance that we're studying, we call this endothermic. When the energy exits the, the substance or the object that we're studying, that we're looking at, we call this exothermic. All right, so that's for physical changes or heat transfers. Now let's take a look at chemical changes. So before I talk about chemical reactions or, or the, the energy involved in chemical reactions, I wanna explain how a chemical reaction occurs. So you have, you already know this, you have reactants. Now these reactants, what they do is that they collide together. And as they collide, their bonds break. Okay, so all these bonds break. Obviously, it's not all the molecules that will do this at the same time. It's gradual. But as the bonds are breaking, you end up with a bunch of loose um, atoms. Now, 
In order to break these bonds, these substances need to absorb energy. Uh, oops, absorb, yes. Absorb energy. Okay, so these substances will absorb energy, it will break their bonds. Now, these individual atoms, which, once they're all separate, are very energized and substances and atoms don't like to be highly energized. They'd rather be a little bit calmer and have less energy. So what are they going to do? They will recombine into new substances. By doing this, they will release some of that excess energy that they had. Okay, so it doesn't matter what kind of chemical reaction we're looking at. It's always the same process. There's some energy absorbed at first to break the bonds and then um, some of that energy is released after the fact when the new bonds are formed. And it's the difference between the two amounts, the net difference, that will determine if the reaction ultimately absorbed or released energy in the end. Okay? So if we take a look at an exothermic change, this is what will happen. So let me describe this graph so you understand it. So this is the energy, this is the progress of the reaction, so this is basically time. So my reactants have a certain amount of energy, it doesn't matter what the amount is in this case, but they have a certain amount of energy. They absorb energy to break their bonds. Now as I explained to you, at that point in time, we have a bunch of separate atoms that are highly energized, right? Because this amount of energy is higher on the scale. Now, these atoms are not happy being highly energized. They will recombine, form new bonds, and release energy in the process. That energy goes into the environment. And the new bonds are formed. And these products have now, in this example, lower energy than the reactants did. So overall, you can see over here, overall, if I look at the difference between the amount of energy absorbed and the amount of energy released during the whole process, well, ultimately, there's more energy released, right? So there's an exit of energy, so that's why we call it exothermic. So this would be an example of an exothermic reaction. So the amount of energy for the bonds broken, the amount of energy absorbed, is smaller then the amount of energy that was released during the second phase of the reaction where the new bonds are formed. So overall, it gives us an exothermic reaction. Okay, so this would, be a, this would be how it would look if it's expressed in a form of a graph. Now, if we look at the actual value, how do we express this with the chemical reaction equation? Well, our value will be negative. Okay, so if we have more energy release, if it's an exothermic reaction, we express this with a negative value. This over here, delta H, is the symbol for the energy of a given reaction. And that energy is expressed in kilojoules. Okay, so often the numbers are very large, so we don't use joules, we use kilojoules as the unit for the energy involved in a reaction. Okay, so in this case, because it's negative or because it's exothermic, we'll represent that with a negative uh, value. Now, this is if we express the energy as a standalone. If we integrate it into a reaction equation, that energy is never expressed as a negative. So what we will do instead, we'll put plus, but we'll put the energy on the product side to show as if the energy in the end is exiting the whole process. Okay, so you have an actual example over here, CH4 plus O2 gives me CO2 and H2O, and there's 810 kilojoules of energy that is released at the same time as these two substances are produced. So you notice over here, I put it with a positive sign. So that's the way we express it within a reaction, but if... I'm going to express it as just a standalone energy outside of a reaction, I have to put the little negative sign to show that it's energy released. Now sometimes what you're going to see is the energy in kilojoules per mole of something. So what we mean is that it's per mole of this substance, for example. Very often it's going to be the substance that's on the left-hand side, the first one, 
because it's kind of the, the substance that is at the center of the reaction. In this case, we have a combustion and we have CH4 that is burning. Okay, so the whole equation or the whole reaction revolves around CH4. So that's why we're going to say for every mole of CH4 that reacts, along with the proper amounts, okay, it doesn't mean that the other substances are not involved. This energy is for the entire process, the entire reaction. But for one mole of CH4 that reacts with the proper amounts of the rest being reacting or being produced, this is the amount of energy released in this case because it's negative by the whole process. Okay, so that's for an exothermic reaction. Now let's take a look at the endothermic one. So the endothermic one will be the opposite. There's going to be more energy absorbed during the breaking of the bonds than energy released when the new bonds are being formed. And that's going to give us overall an amount of energy that is absorbed. So we're going to call it an endothermic reaction. So if we take a look at the graph, visually it might help you understand the process. So we have the reactants. They absorb energy to break their bonds. Then we have a bunch of separate atoms that are highly energetic. They don't like it. They're not stable. They want to get some of that energy uh, out into the, the environment. So they're going to release some energy, form new bonds, and become the products. Now you can see that the difference between the amount of energy absorbed and the amount of energy released during the process gives us an overall positive amount. This is bigger than this in terms of value. So this net amount is positive, indicating that this reaction is endothermic. There was more energy absorbed than released during the process. Now if we take a look at how we express this amount of energy within a reaction equation, this is what it would look like. So first of all, it would be expressed with a positive sign. So overall, the whole reaction being endothermic, there's more energy absorbed than released. So we use a positive sign to represent this reality. If we want to integrate the energy within the reaction equation, we will put the energy on the reactant side as if the reactants absorb some energy in order to form the products. Now we know that there's really two steps to this whole process. The reactants will absorb energy, break their bonds, and then the atoms will recombine to form the products, and then that part of the process will release energy. But the difference between the two parts overall represent a net absorption of energy. So again, we put the energy on the reactant side if it is endothermic. You have an example here. So this represents the electrolysis of water. So we use electricity, a source of energy, to break down the molecules of water in order to form hydrogen and oxygen gas. Now, if we don't want to express this energy within the reaction, we can express it as a delta H, also called enthalpy. We express it with a positive value again. In this case, because we're breaking down water, we will say per mole of H2O. Now, you will notice that this value and this value are not the same. Why? Because here we have the amount per mole of water. So for every mole of water broken down, one mole of water requires 244 kilojoules of energy. Now, within our standard reaction, there's really two moles of water involved. So if there are two moles involved, so double the amount of water, well, this will require double the amount of energy as well. So you have to be careful about this. When you express the energy outside of the equation, you express it per mole, for one mole of a given substance, the reference substance within the equation. But when you integrate the energy within the equation, you have to pay attention to how many moles of that same substance are present. So in this case, because we have two moles of water present, for every two moles of water that breaks down, that break down, this is the amount of energy required. And of course, because this equation is balanced, we know that two moles of H2 will be created and one mole of O2 will be created. All right? 
Now let's take this one step further. You could be asked to do stoichiometry using energy. You will treat energy the same way as, as if it was a substance. I'm going to show you what I mean by this. So the question is, how much energy would there be if 6 mole of B reacted with a sufficient amount of A? So in this case, we are comparing the amount of B to the energy involved in the reaction. Again, it doesn't mean that A is not present. It doesn't mean that C is not present and D is not present. They are, but as I explained to you, we don't need to pay attention to them. We are really just calculating based on the ratio of B to energy. And we know that because this whole equation is balanced, these amounts would also uh, appear or disappear in the case of a reactant in the same ratios. Okay, so we're just going to compare B to the energy. So this standard equation says that 3 moles of B that participate in this reaction with the correct amounts of everything else will release 100 kilojoules of energy. And you'll notice that I put a negative sign, although this is positive, but we just said that when the energy is on the product side, it's really exothermic. Exothermic, we put the negative sign. So 3 moles of B reacting with everything else will involve a hundred, the release of 100 kilojoules of energy. The question asks, what if there were 6 moles of B involved? How much energy would there be? Well, obviously, this, is, this one is easy. We know we're doubling the amount of B, so really we'd be doubling the energy, right? So we'd get 200 kilojoules of energy released by this equation. Now, let's say these numbers were not this easy to deal with. We would cross multiply three, oops, sorry. Minus 100 times six divided by three, sorry, would give me minus 200 kilojoules, okay? Now, Obviously, since we're doubling the amount of B, that would imply that the amount of A would have been doubled, the amount of C would have been doubled, and the amount of D would have been doubled, and we just calculated that the energy would come out to 200 in this case rather than 100, okay? But again, because this whole thing is balanced, we can just compare two items within the equation, whether there are two substances or one substance with the energy. So you can also do stoichiometry using energy. All right, that's it for this lesson. Hopefully it was clear. If you have questions, you know what to do. Otherwise, I'll see you around for your next lesson. And in the meantime, take care.